Hi everyone, welcome to the Gama Sutra Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. I am a contributing editor at Gamasutra.com. And uh, I am joined today in the lower left hand corner by two wonderful folks. Alex, could you quickly introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, I am still a Gama Sutra editor, Alex Waro, and today we are joined by a very special developer. Uh, my friend, would you introduce yourself and sort of explain what you work on? Hi, I'm Mark Essen. I'm creative director at Messhoff. I worked on Nidhogg 1 and now Nidhogg 2. Um, Nidhogg 2, Nidhogg Harder? Mm. Nidhogg, the sequel. All right. Yeah. Um, I'd ask Nidhogg. you to introduce yeah. Nidhogg, but maybe it's best if we just show it. Uh, Alex, would you mm. pick, settle on a character and let's get killing? It's just so many choices. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be a tricky interview to pull off um, without letting Brian just roll over me. Uh, Mark, this game is out this week, right? Uh, yeah, it came out on the 15th uh, on PS4 and Steam. I think you guys are playing the PS4 copy. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Can, can we talk a little bit um, just briefly about the, the the thought process and the, and the production behind this game coming off of Nidhogg, uh, the original, uh, a few years back? Um. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I guess we want to do. Yeah, what, <laughs> we just what, is, to do... <laughs> what is Nidhogg and why does it exist? Let's you guys, I'm really bad at this game. Oh, man. Start there. <laughs> um, Nidhogg is, uh, it plays like some older arcade games. It has that, like, um, it's like less to do with animations and more about where your weapons are actually held. And uh, the significance of, like, if you hold your sword high, it means anything that touches that sword on a pixel basis gets blocked. And I don't know. I was thinking about things like that while playing some older arcade games and then just tried to make a two-player <laughs> version of that. Yep. So, I don't know. And then it kind of just went from there, from, like, working on it for five or so years. Um, a lot of things changed along the way just by, like, trying different things out. And then with Nidhogg 2, I just wanted to go back and change some of the more fundamental things, like just the way the player is controlled, the effects of things like dive kicks, um, mm -hmm. and in addition to that, make new weapons and uh, new levels and just change up a lot of stuff that didn't feel like it would fit with the original game. I kind of wanted to make like a, just, a, yeah, just a sequel, I guess. So that's what this is. <laughs> I guess a, a solid question for developers um, might be, why did you, in the age of Steam, because uh, the first Nidhogg did come out on Steam, um, how come you went for a sequel as opposed to updating the original? Because you've got a whole new look here. You've got some yep. new combat systems. Uh, you've got these better head stomps that Alex is inflicting on me. Mm. Um, oh. We... Well, for a number of reasons, like some of them are, like I mentioned before, just mechanically, I wanted to change some of the, just the actual movement of the characters feels different. Uh, the size of the characters on screen is different. That affects a lot of things. And like mm -hmm. a, um, but also just, we wanted to grow our team and we wanted to experiment with new art styles. And I wanted to move from a kind of programmer, artist, everything kind of role to just more of a creative director that... Um, had a team of people helping out of the game that had, you know, different people had different ownerships. For different, so we have like a lead artist that um, I worked with to develop the look for, but it's really like his style that comes through. And we have a networking programmer that's been amazing and he kind of takes care of the online play. Um, we had a port person that helped us with the PlayStation port. We have PR people. Um, Christy took over the soundtrack and a bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh God! So it, was just, it was it was fun to try to scale up our own production in addition to like the way the game looks and plays and gotcha. Yeah, just adding much stuff. Yeah. Cool. So. Um, just um to explain the nature of our live chat today, uh, we will take be taking questions from the chat, so feel free to throw them out. Neo Cow plays asks, uh, do you think the rigid structure, mostly two people must own the game to play, has uh, limited the appeal of these Nidhogg games? Although it's not entirely true, because one person could own Nidhogg and you could play it local. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the better ways to play anyway, just uh, because there's no latency. Um, yeah. And the only but, reason we're doing online right now is my cat isn't very good at this game. Yeah, I guess I don't really know what the alternative is. Uh, like a free-to-play, I guess. Yeah. Which, I don't know if that really makes sense. 
Yeah, well, like, let's get into that for a second, right? I mean, I, I, I want to circle back in a little while and get back to the, the, the changes, you've, the design, the art, and everything else. But, like, starting right off, when this game, when the original Nidhogg came out, it was to, like, to my perspective, one of, um, like, the leading examples of what had become, like, what, what seemed like at the time, uh, a new renaissance in local multiplayer games. Uh, and I don't know if that really played out the way I thought it would, but definitely Nidhogg was one of like the, the one of the games in the forefront of that. Um, how has how has the reception to this game been different from that like that game at that time? Like, uh, has the landscape of, of local multiplayer games changed? Like, are you seeing are you expecting this to sell better or worse or in a different way than it did? Uh, sorry, than the original did a couple years ago. Well, um. Yeah, I don't know if it's so much about the landscape of couch co-op games or local multiplayer games, but I think it's more just like Steam has changed a lot, and you know PlayStation Four has changed a bit. But um, mm. there's just exponentially more games being released on Steam at a time, so you can't really hope to have the same amount of uh, eyeball- eyeballs on the game when it first launches. So mm. with this game, we've our plan's always been to just support it f- for a long time and just keep adding content and try to keep it fresh. Um, Hmm. So, I don't know. so uh, I'm curious. Like looking back at how Nidhogg did, did it match up with your expectations? Like, um, given like how it seemed like that game had a lot of like pause, like it got a lot of acclaim, right? And it got a lot of buzz at like the convention circuit at places like PAX and uh, Indicate and that kind of stuff. So, th- did that pan out the way you expected it to during development? Well, for Nidhogg One, um, Nidhogg yeah. One exceeded our wildest expectations. We were super happy with that. Um, one of, that was one of the reasons we thought we could get away with doing a sequel because you know we had existing fans out there that might be interested. So, mm. um, so yeah, we were super happy with that. And I think Nidhogg 2's launch has been different, but, uh, but good. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, uh, so let, let's like dig into those changes and why you thought they were interesting, right? Like, so like let's start with these weapons, like which is totally driving me nuts. Trying to stay up with Brian is there's a there's a cadence, right? There's a there's a pattern by which you, the weapons you spawn with. Yeah, there's a set order, and the default one is like uh, rapier. <laughs> no, I forget rapier, longsword, dagger, bow. I think something like that. Um, and it's always looping around in that same order per player. Um, but you can change it in the previous screen you're on, where you picked your characters. Yeah. Uh, why did you find that to be intriguing? And what uh, what 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 issues did it address? What weaknesses did it address in the original design, if any? Well. Um, just less stale for one thing. Um, you have to. There's a lot more to keep in your head. Like, what did they have last? What are they getting next? Um, when that person spawns in front of you, like, how do you react to them based on the matchup and weapons and the you know layout in the level where you are? Like, mm-hmm. do you have the high ground? Does that matter? What weapon do you, you know, do you want to like get rid of this weapon? Pick up something else. Um, so it's a lot to think about, like instantly when the new person spawns. Um, so like uh, something that's interesting about that just from like a uh the perspective of a player is uh, i went back and played the original nidhogg a little bit last night mm-hmm. back and forth like in between matches of this and it's um it's it's much simpler but it doesn't feel this is going to be like kind of vague it doesn't feel like it's um less of a game it feels like a more uh elegant and pared down version of this game uh so i wonder like what um like what? Uh, what value does this added complexity bring to the design? Do you think? Like you, you talk about making it just more interesting and, and having it like more, more to do. Like why you think that? What? Well, pardon me. Why do you think that's important to uh, games design? Well, um, well, I just think it's interesting for players to like make different kinds of decisions. I mean, it's all sort of like in the same realm as Nidhogg One, but there's just. More to think about and more strategies to employ. I mean, in, with Nidhogg One, there was at a certain point, there's only so many strategies you can do, and then it just beca- becomes like a mind game of like, which of these three am I going to do? It's obvious mm-hmm. there's only these three options, really. So with this, there's like, I just think there's a lot more room for player improvisation, and uh, yeah, I think it's more entertaining to watch. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, having shown both of them at a booth before for like eight hours a day for multiple days, I think this one. I'm more entertained by it, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's important. Right? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I think um, definitely when, when this game was uh, sort of like publicly revealed, I think there was a lot of 
uh, surprise at the art style. Uh, sure. And I, I, I certainly was taken aback. And now that uh, I've had some time with it, uh, I think it's it's very charming and goofy in a really like fun way. Um, like, why did you? What motivated that change from like a very readable, very pared down? Uh, aesthetic to this kind of just like weird cartoonish gore tastic. Ah! <laughs> yes. um, yeah, I think it's still pretty readable. I mean, it's not. Yeah, um, we just number one, we wanted to change it up. Uh, number two, I was going through a lot of like mechanical changes just to the way the game worked, and one of them, one of the things I wanted to change was to move from a pixel collision to a hitbox system. Mm -hmm. So this has hitboxes rather than like the pixels of your character being collision boxes. Mm. Um, so yeah. that meant that you know it didn't really make sense to keep the same art style. There was no reason to keep the same art style, and uh, we wanted to work with an artist who could do a number of styles. So why stick to you know my very rudimentary drawings? That I just wanted to change it up. Um, mm. I mean, I, that's the main reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds like you, uh, and you mentioned earlier, like you had an interest in, in sort of taking a more creative director type role rather than just being the sole creator for the most part. Uh, yeah. What was that process like? What did you learn from it now that it's all over with? I learned that I really liked it. Um, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great. It makes the game feel fresh for me to work on. I can kind of move around to different points and work on different things. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, it's just it's a super motivating factor for me, and I've realized that I'm not, you know, the best at certain areas, and I can find people that are way better than me. Uh, so we have like this. I, originally, I tried to do the netcode myself with help from a uh, from a student of mine at USC, mm -hmm. and that worked okay. But um, but this is just like miles beyond that. It's so much better, um, and it's constantly being worked on without me having to, you know. Get my hands dirty. I can I can keep working on like new weapons and stuff like that while I have um, the support of other team members trying to fix things like little things that are broken. Is that sort of uh, easier on you from like a mental health perspective or harder? Like the idea that you are no longer so almost solely responsible for this game's like support and upkeep. Um, but it's super, it's way better. I mean, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was you know it's definitely like a learning process to learn how to uh, collaborate well with people um learn how to like give direction without you know without giving the impression that this was the only way it had to be you know mm. um, because we picked our team we picked our team because everyone on it is super talented in their own right and so mm -hmm. i think for a while toby might have i think toby was trying to draw to what he thought i wanted and what i wanted was his just like his style of animation that I'd seen everywhere else. So, um, so yeah, it was That's just a, a it was a learning process, and le I hadn't collaborated like that in a long time. So it's been, you know, interesting. But now that we're like on the same wavelength, it's been amazing. That's so interesting. I mean, it's too bad we can't have Toby here. But like, what was he? What did he think you wanted out of him? Like, what was the original like art on this looking like? Well, I guess I didn't really know what I wanted either. Um, mm -hmm. But we we went through a lot of like iterations of more kind of realistic muscly dudes <laughs> 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 and like um, higher res style mm -hmm. and uh, it just looked it looked super I don't know kind of I guess corny but just rigid in a way mm -hmm. that you know cartoon characters are just they animate better it just it feels more lively um, so know. maybe we could. Um... And obviously, Brian and I are having a tough time, like really digging deep, because we're also trying to just dig deep into each other. But um, maybe we could like sort of walk through uh, like that sort of iteration process, if you can. Like, so you started out with these these characters that were very like uh, it sounds like more like less cartoony and more just like cool buff dudes. Um, like, how did yeah, you hone was... down to what Nidhogg Two is? Um, just a lot of iteration. I mean, I I should do a. A blog post or something showing all the different versions of these characters because they went through a lot. I mean, you even had it on your uh, on your tweet. You used a GIF from quite a few iterations back of what the characters used to look like, um, which is fine. But I'm just saying, like as an example, um, you know, they used to be these fat, naked guys with big eyes, and uh, the eyes got a little bit smaller here. <laughs> like, 
Um, I mean, another big uh, hurdle for us was I, I was kind of set on doing this um, modular animation, like bone-based animation, um, with the hopes that in the future we could add new outfits and like change up the look without redoing every animation in the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, which eventually worked out, but it was a it was kind of a learning process for both of us to figure out how to use this program and how to use it effectively. Um. Well, right, we're back in. So uh, after all that, uh, what this is like kind of a weird question because you know I I think Nidhogg is is a very idiosyncratic game, um, but there are a number of devs who are still working on local multiplayer games like this. So when you talk about like having to learn what you wanted this game to be and having to how to get the thing to do what you wanted it to do. Like, is there any advice you could offer other developers that might help them sort of get through similar trouble with less uh, actual trouble? <laughs> oh. um, I don't know. I mean, do you want to... I guess just, like, the biggest advice I can offer is just to structure your project in a way that we can change things easily. Mm -hmm. Like, don't... You know, if you're coding an animation or whatever, or if you're coding like an attack, make it modular enough where you can like change different attributes of the attack. And if you make a subsequent attack, it doesn't it doesn't rely on that first attack. You can just like layer things together in different ways and see what fits. Mm -hmm. um, that was a big that was a big part of the project. Um, just like getting the once I figured out like how I wanted what like. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's cool. Uh, Take that. My friend, my friend Gabe, that went to actual game design school, uh, called them levers. Like trying to figure out the game design levers for the weapons. Like, what attributes are you changing between weapons, and how can you then figure out future weapons by creating different combinations of these levers? Um, and so that was so trying to figure out like what the levers were for the rapier and how to like create a different kind of weapon that was similar enough that you would understand it immediately. Um, yeah. But it had like different, you know, whatever it is, attack speeds or ranges or just idiosyncrasies like hold and release for the bow, um, mm -hmm. things, you know, things like that. So uh, that seems like it would be way trickier with a team than just by yourself. Is that the case or not so much? Uh, I was still, I still did all like the gameplay programming, um, mm -hmm. so that was my focus this time. Nice. Brian, uh, I need you to lose. So do you have any, like, Wait, really You need thought? me to lose? Yeah, I, I need you to... I won one. What do you mean you well, need, I need me to lose? I need to win again. Uh, so I need you to, like, like really think hard about, like, some really in-depth questions that you would uh, ask. Um, I guess, uh, could you go into more about those levers? Like, what, what were some of the levers <laughs> you used to work on these weapons and make them work for this game? Um... Yeah, like one of them would be the height, how many heights it has available. Um, you know, how fast it is to attack with, how fast it is to throw. Mm -hmm. uh, can it be blocked? Can it be bounced? Um, you know, what's the hitbox on the attack? Like for the... Uh, what does it do to other weapons? Like are there certain combinations where it's better or worse? Like the broadsword, for instance, can disarm other weapons if you hit them. Yeah. Um, Ooh. Ooh. Uh, the arrows can be bounced. They can be reflected if you hit them with a weapon. But you know, um, I, uh, yeah, I I mean, wonder it's stuff that sounds obvious now. But it's like when you when I was first starting, I was just like, oh my god, this is all hard coded in such a weird way. How do I like pull things apart and then create new reconfigurate or new configurations of these elements? So that was just you know that was a process for me. <laughs> Um, I uh oh sorry go ahead. Ah! I was gonna say, what kind of was your goal with the art style for this game? Because we talked earlier about why you made the change, just because there's something you you want to have more than programmer art. But what do you think? Like, what were you? This is sort of weird. Like, what like trying to ask you what you were trying to say when it should be ap apparent from the game. But like, what what did you think Nidhogg Two needed to be Nidhogg Two here? <laughs> Um, I wanted like more detailed art. I wanted to just create a higher resolution game. So this is like twice the resolution, which is not saying much. Mm -hmm. But um, but at the same time, I wanted to I wanted to control from a gameplay perspective of how the attacks worked because so much of it is dependent on where the weapon looks like it is on screen, mm -hmm. even if that's not actually how we program the hitboxes. But um, 
So like for an attack, for a kick, for a lunge, I kind of need to be in control of like the speed and location of everything. Yeah. So I had to be a kind of animator. So I wanted this modular animation system so that I could tweak anything that Toby animated. Um, and then I also just, I like things to feel alive. So I wanted to have a system where we could have lots and lots and lots of frames of animation to have the characters constant, like moving and undulating. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, you know. Just Poke would cool. like to know why the dive kick was nerfed between the hogs. The dive kick was nerfed because I wanted to focus more on just the different combinations of weapons. Um, you know, in the original Nidhogg, the dive kick was such a good... You know, it's one of, like, three strategies you could have. You could have, like, a sword, or you could just be running and doing dive kicks, or you could, like, throw your sword and then dive kick. Um, and it made the game a lot faster paced, and I wanted to kind of slow it down, um, add more, like, footsie elements, and keep the focus on these new weapons and the best ways to use them without throwing them. So, can we just dig into that for a second? You said footsie elements. That's like a. That's the only thing I only hear hardcore fighting game fans talk about footsies. Can we talk about what you mean by that and why you thought that was important? Um, Bill, it's super important in Nidhogg because it has this like inactive uh, stab. I don't know what you want to call it. It's not, I haven't figured out a good term for it. But if you uh, just hold your sword out without touching the controller, you can still kill your opponent if they run into you. Mm-hmm. Um, so range pre- plays a big role in the game. You have to know like how far the lunge goes, how far the swing goes. Um, and so sometimes, you know, not right now, but like sometimes you might find yourself in a situation where like one place for one person has the high ground or one person is standing across a gap and you're trying to like figure out if you can land in front of them and then stab them or see if you can like get them to edge close enough to the ledge so you can swing your sword at them or jump over them or so it's uh, yeah, so it's kinda like puts you in like a street fighter where you're trying to figure out, you know, can I maneuver this person so that I can land this Hadouken kind of thing. Mark, do you play a lot of fighting games? Not really. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good me either. Sure. Uh, which is, you know, like uh, this I, I'm, I'm, I, never mind. I, 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 there was like a whole line to go down with. There was like so. There I mean, was I've, just, yeah, I've, yeah, I've played a lot. Not you know, not very seriously. I've played a lot of Tekken growing up, and a lot of like Street Fighter Two. Though I never got very good at that. Um, or a lot of Marvel versus Capcom in college. Um, when you're playing, but, when you are playing other games, whether they're fighting games or other combat games, what are you looking for that you think is like good combat design? What do you think? What do you think really makes game fighting fun? Um. I like games like Smash or Marvel vs. Capcom that have like a very uh, simplified combo system where you can kind of intuit like what the controller buttons might be to do a combo over and over. So um, I never played a game enough to figure out like all the different moves for each character or like even for one character. So Nidhogg is sort of it's a fighting game that doesn't have combos really. Hmm. Was Nidhogg ever played at Evo? I feel like this is... Oh. Yeah, we've shown, it, we've shown it at a booth at Evo uh, a number of years. We didn't go this past year. Um, it's never been like a stage game on Evo. but One day. One day it should day. be. <laughs> oh, I like this Whoa. level. I've never played this level. Is it good? Yeah. What is this level? It's the level... Winter. This one actually... This level is interesting because... Uh, um, like, as the... As the ice flows go up and down... Um, you uh like you you wind up having a better or worse angle to attack someone who's on the next ice flow, especially with the bow. Oh, jeez. All right. Yeah. Okay. Or I hmm. just keep falling off. <laughs> um, Chris Graft in the chat, uh, the one and only Chris Graft. Um, promise I'll keep. Who's Chris? Who's Chris Graft? I don't know. Good yeah, question. I don't know. Um, wants to know how you iterated on the level design here, because these are not obviously like fight. Nidhog probably has fighting game levels that don't work like any other fighting game. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we iterate? We just, uh, I would, you know, sketch out something or Toby would have an idea of like a piece of level geometry and I would figure out how it was all laid out and then just play it a bunch. And uh, I created a level editor that you can play at runtime so you can just like pop players in, play around, you know, change things up as you're playing. Um, so, oh, oh, oh. yeah, I, um, I, I, uh, is there like a something that's been bugging me since the original? Is there is there an overriding uh, lore behind Nidhogg? Is there a mythos that is yeah. into that here that you guys designed this around? And like, what we is have that? a um, 
we have a secret lore Bible that I'll never show anyone. Uh huh. Um, so tell me about your lore Bible. Oh, oh. <laughs> we haven't filled up all the pages yet, but we're about like yeah, almost halfway through. Mm. So room for a sequel, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Make it a trilogy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you really got to complete the arc. Make a Nidhogg uh, strategy game. A verse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, it is. Uh, whoa, jeez, jeez. Sorry, Brian. It's okay. Uh, uh, oh God, I'm gonna make it. Um, so how has uh, how has launch gone? This is the opening week. You've got a cross-platform debut. It's not your first time at the rodeo, but like the landscape has changed. Um, yeah. So what was it looking like this early on? Um, well, it's been good. Um... Oh, yeah, we've geez. been happy with the numbers. I don't know. <laughs> good, that's good. That's fantastic. Yeah. What do you think that's has a... changed between um, the Nidhogg One release when the world that gave birth to Nidhogg One, the world that gave birth to Nidhogg Two? What's changed? Yeah, from an indie well, perspective. I mean, from like a on the storefront uh, side of things, you know, there's just a lot more competition on Steam at least. Mm-hmm. And it's more algorithmically curated than it used to be, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, also, like YouTubers and you know, Twitch channels seem to play a much bigger role now than they did like three years ago. Mm-hmm. So, did um, you take any significantly different steps to address that, or is that just sort of? Yeah, uh, we actually found a PR company, Evolve PR, and uh, our account manager Brian has been amazing. Brian Rowe. Shout out to Brian. Shout, Shout out, out to Brian. To Brian. Uh, <laughs> yes, he sort of educated us about all this stuff, and you know, nice. It's been I, uh, interesting. Oh, 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 I was going to change this to sudden death, but here we go for another round. Um, you also you alluded to it earlier, but I want to get into it for a second. You do you, you still teach at all, or no. is this okay? Uh, no, I've been doing this full time since Nidhogg One. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, as I recall, there was a big gap between kind of when Nidhogg One was announced and when Nidhogg Two came. out. When it, or when, and then when it came out, but Nidhogg 2 seemed to come a lot faster than that gap. Uh, can you explain why? Um, so the is you well, yeah, we had, we had a team. We, we were able to afford a team to work with us, and yeah. that really sped things up. And, so Nidhogg you know, just, we, were, we were familiar with all the processes. We did another game in between them, Fly Wrench, so that was yeah. our first game that we'd ported mm-hmm. ourselves to PlayStation, so everything just, you know, we, just, we got better at making games, I guess. Um, cool. Whoa. Oh, jeez. I guess it helps when your first game pays for your second, as opposed to having nothing to pay for your first game. Yeah, that's ideal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, God. What's going? Uh, I'm curious about like these 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 things that obscure gameplay here. Why do you think these work to make Nidhogg good? Uh, I mean, we use them somewhat sparingly. This level has the most, but um, I don't go, know, go, just go, kind go, of go, fun, go. fun mm-hmm. set pieces to play with. You can crouch and then uh, crawl through them. And um, you know, try to surprise your opponent that way. I've seen that a lot. Or if you shoot arrows through it, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, it does seem more. Uh, this is kind of silly, but it seems more readable than similar setups in the original. Where I think there was at least one level where there was like a tall grass section, and it was cool. Like I, I really enjoyed it, but it could be very difficult to tell when somebody was actually like in the grass at all, Whoa. or where they were. Whoa. Jeez. Okay. All right. All right. I didn't realize right. I was going to take this so intense today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Nidhogg is, is no joke, man. Like, Nidhogg is, uh, uh, like I said, I, I really feel like uh, when it seemed like that aborted renaissance of local multiplayer was happening, Nidhogg was at the forefront. Oh. Uh, yeah, it was like Nidhogg and Towerfall, which was kind of like, I guess you might call it like the Indiecade renaissance, because a lot of them were like playable Indiecade, and it was a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah, yeah Samurai Gun, Towerfall, uh, Gang Beasts, I feel like, is a, I think they're doing pretty well. Yeah, Gang Beast is, uh, I think, still holding up. They had just had a Rick and Morty crossover promo. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, jeez. You guys should totally get Rick and Morty in this game. <laughs> That's a good idea. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, still page the lore Bible. Oh. Is there a widely accepted best Nidhogg player? Do you know? This um, we have a discord channel and i think some people have been uh saying that they're the best i haven't i haven't tested that yet no. oh gosh oh gosh oh, uh, get down. i think i'm best in the household nice studio 
Nice. Household Studio. I was uh, Let's take my claim. Uh, a, a key something that is like, whoa. what? <laughs> Wait, who's better? Uh oh. Christy says not true, but she's wrong. Contention in the ranks. Oh geez. Um, I you may not be able to speak to this like super uh, directly, but I find netcode to be a fascinating challenge. Um, I've always felt like when you're talking about uh, fighting games, you know, like not not capital F fighting games, but just like games in which two two players are competing. Uh, GG <laughs> is like one of the um, like standards, and I, I kind of want to get. Uh, what is it? What is the one? Jeez, what is the one? Oh, GGPO, you mean? Yeah, GGPO. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, GG. Um, I kind of want to get some more of your thoughts on how you decided to do your own netcode. I, I know, I know, someone else programmed it, but why did you go about right. um, going down that route instead of trying to adapt something that was already in place? Um, I don't know that GGPO has been used in a game. Program oh, yes. using our middleware that's called GameMaker. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think it would be as much of a challenge to probably integrate that as to write our own. Um, so currently we're using this method that is just input lag. So based on your ping, you'll have X number of frames before what you press actually happens in the game. That's true for both players. So it's uh, it's not unfair, but it's like it feels a little bit uh, less immediate than local play would be. But Shortly, we're testing this now, and we're going to launch it as soon as we can. Um, we have a rollback system that does a combination of minimal input lag and also predictive inputs, just like GGPO does. So it's not using their exact tech, but it's the same idea. I think there's a number of these rollback uh, plugins available, but this will be our own, and we'll launch it soon. Very excited nice. about it. Because <laughs> nice. uh, our system works pretty well, but Sometimes your connection, even if it's good, you'll have these like random spikes of lag, mm -hmm. um, which in our case will freeze the game because it's waiting for specific packets. But once we have this rollback enabled, it'll just smooth those over. Um. Nice. Yeah, we were talking before we just started streaming um, about this game's sort of online component. Uh, and we were getting into, like just for the moment at least, how it's relatively informal in an online match. Like if someone kind of wants to just quit out, they can just do that, I think. And they can all, like, there also is no, like, formal process for, like, deciding who gets to pick the level. Or you just kind of, like, both do it and whoever hit X first yeah. gets it, just, just like local. <laughs> right. um, and I think that kind of informality is refreshing online. Um, Brian suggested it could be abused. Like, how have you, how did you go about thinking through that process of implementing it that way? Speaking of which, um, yeah, we just tried to keep, keep the same attitude as local play and just, like, you know, you can chat online, not on the PlayStation 4, but you, in Steam you can chat. Um, and But I think you can kind of get someone's intention. Like, if someone backs out of a level immediately after it starts, they probably want to play a different level, and that's fine. Um, so, I don't know. It's like, it's not a super serious game. Like, if you play in ranked mode, it's different, and if you quit out, then you lose. But um, at the moment, ranked is just a way for equally skilled people to find each other. Mm -hmm. and, Eventually, we want to add some like badges and stuff, but um, but yeah, just nice. trying to keep keep it fun, keep it light. Let's see, uh, Alex. How about uh, we make this the last local game, and then I'll jump to arcade, just that you have you you, you uh, that way you you can stop beating me. <laughs> sure. I don't know, baby. Um, I don't know if you try baby. Um, the the baby. Yeah, I want to uh, see. Oh, baby. <laughs> this is baby it's mode. Baby mode. It's, it's yeah. It's it's a thing. How do we kill it's, each uh, other? It's real tricky. It's uh, baby it's, mode it's, plus low gravity. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's true pro level. This is this is esports right here, basically. This is uh, my favorite's boomerang swords. It's always been. Boomerang swords are really good. Um, you know, this is kind of silly because this uh, this this storied franchise is, is quite a few years old. So I'm sure you've dug into this in depth in the past, but it's been a while since I've really heard it. So I kind of wonder, what was the origin of Nidhogg? You know, all the way back when it was Raging Hadron or whatever. Like, where did the idea for this kind of game design come from? Uh, yeah, it came from playing some MAME games uh, with my roommate Andy Copus. Mm -hmm. Shout out. Um, <laughs> There was this one game called Great Swordsman, which was 
uh, just a fencing game where you could move your weapon between three positions and first touch won the game. You know, like real fencing rules. Uh-huh. Um, but it was single player, so I wanted to make a player that, or a version that I could play two player. Um, and, you know, making games takes a while, so I was mostly playing it against myself. And mm-hmm. it's just like. Little by little, it became this this game about running to one side of the screen, and then little by little, it became against a game about like running back and forth across a larger screen, and then, you know, eventually it was more of this tug of war game than about uh, actually landing fencing hits. So, just you know, it kind of came from nowhere. (laughs) Yep, boomerang arrow, just just like that boomerang (laughs) arrow. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. Um, Boxstar mm-hmm. Pixel Art wants to know if you have any advice for developers making their own local multiplayer brawlers like this. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's all about testing. It's all about playing it with people. So, mm-hmm. um, and you want to get as many new people as you can, because that's a good way to figure out like the holes in your design or your usability are. So, mm-hmm. uh, keep the controls simple. I don't know. I mean, make whatever you want to make, but get, yeah. get people to play it. <laughs> uh, no. uh, no. uh, no. uh, I am um, using Game Maker. I have a input library. If you don't want to like deal with custom controls and stuff, you can just like it's free. It's on GitHub. Just like mm-hmm. pop it in there. God damn it, That's Brian. cool. How how much um of that kind of shared resource stuff from GitHub was important? Um, or have you have you just started leaving those things behind for other developers? I've been leaving some stuff behind. I've also we used a little bit of uh, some assets from the game maker marketplace, like the um, it's like a f- procedural fire effect that we grabbed and tweaked. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I like that. I like sharing that kind of stuff. Cool. Oh, oh, oh okay. I thought I left baby mode on for arcade mode somehow, but I guess it doesn't exist in arcade mode. Arcade mode, yeah, it has like set weapons. Like in the first level, yeah. it's only rapier. Um, no time limit. Yeah. All right, Brian. Um, Shake the W wants to know if they can expect upgrades and uh, kind of building on that stuff. Uh, were you giving upgrades for Nidhogg One, and what has made you like? What what kind of up, what what do you think a game like this needs when it comes to upgrades, like updates? I should say. Sorry. For Nidhogg One, we just we felt like that was it. That was the game. Uh, we did a lot of updates just related to bug fixing and improving the net the net code. Um, but in terms of content, we didn't really add anything. Mm-hmm. Um, with this one, we we want people to see it within the same world as things like Rainbow Six, Siege, and like Overwatch, and that kind of game where the metagame shifts over time as we add new weapons and people uncover new strategies. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of our goal. We, we just want to keep updating it, not only with gameplay stuff, but also like fun cosmetic stuff. Yeah. Um, as far as metagames, though, can you share me... So I'm playing another uh, tabletop game, which I may have mentioned a few too many times in the game, <laughs> called X-Wing. And mm-hmm. I am playing with some people who are frustrated by like one, th- one strategy in the meta seemingly having no counter at the moment, so everyone's using it. Um, mm-hmm. How have you as a developer like approach thinking about that? Because we did qui- we, like, we quizzed those devs about their opinions about it. How are you f- get- getting ready to think about... like? The strategy that will beat everything and how you handle that, or or when a new strategy comes in, suddenly it's a strategy everyone's using. Right. Um, yeah, I haven't seen that yet with this game. With the first game, uh, I don't know if it was like an unbeatable strategy or why people were using it, but people just devolve into throwing the weapon and then dive kicking. Mm-hmm. That seems to be like the main thing people that have played for a while do. Uh, with this game, I haven't really seen that as much. Um, so I don't know, but that's fair. Yeah, yeah totally. Fair. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't know how I would approach it. Um, I wouldn't want to change the game too much and like break things, but I don't know. We'll see. I guess we'll we'll see. <laughs> we will find out. Um, let's see. Uh, I think, unfortunately, Alex, do you have any more questions, or does anyone in chat have any more questions? I'm just running. I just want to keep playing this game at this point. Whoop. Yeah. No, I mean it's it's tricky to to stream a game like this because it demands so much. Like this is going to sound silly because like games are by typically by definition like 
like highly interactive like moment to moment experiences that that like suck in a player's experience but something about this game really uh like demands attention in a way that makes it tricky to come up with really cogent uh lines of thought uh Mm -hmm. no there are no questions in the chat but certainly i think we should unpack a little bit more about um like mark how do you 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 talk about you know really enjoying being in like a creative director type position um like uh what sort of sacrifices did you have to make to take on that role like is there anything you miss about just being a like a solo developer like basically taking it on yourself the only thing i miss is doing smaller projects right now Mm -hmm. because we've just been stuck on these bigger projects for a while but i don't know i would gladly work on a smaller project with a team so yeah just yeah. Yeah, I mean like Flywrench seemed like um like a little passion project and that uh that the arc of that game's like development was amazing. The fact that it came out at some point was like uh, a real like but like a real surprise. Um mm-hmm. so I, I wonder like uh you know, sort of stepping away from Nidhogg, which which is incredibly engrossing, um, like how do you feel about your other work, your like non Nidhogg work? Like was Flywrench what you wanted it to be, or do you feel like you're gonna continue to focus um on this for the foreseeable future. Uh, I'm definitely going to focus on Nidhogg for a while and um, super proud of Flywrench the way it turned out yeah. in its latest release. Um, and I'll continue to prototype stuff uh, on my own and try to figure out what our next step is in terms of like a new new IP style project. Um, but uh, for the moment, this is like super fun to work on and I have like a big list of things I want to change and add. So, so yeah, I'm in a happy place right now. <laughs> nice. That's um, we, we we've been talking about that uh, at Gamma Sutra quite a bit. The idea of like what uh, like balancing um, personal contentment and happiness with um, productivity and being able to like get the game shipped right. Uh, yeah, I mean it's out there now, which is like a huge relief. You know, I was definitely getting a little anxious uh, in the months leading up to the launch. Like oh, I kind of want to just like explore some other new things, but. I have this renewed interest in Nidhogg now, now that it's out there and people are playing it. So I'll probably put those other projects on hold for the moment. Now that's interesting. Usually we hear it's like, uh, it's always a question of like, am I ready to release it? Not, you know, like there's always that, that I mean, it's not uncommon certainly to hear that devs feel um, like, you know, they, 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 their creative energy is constrained to one project because they've got to ship it, right? And they've got to right. just be on that all the time. At the same time, there's always that like fear that, I can't ship it yet because it's not done. Like it's not what I wanted it to be. I could tweak this, I could fix this, I could add that. Um, was that a problem for you at all, or not so much? Um, that's where Christy came in to like. Christy is like the master of getting things out the door and keeping things on schedule. So, uh, you know, we knew for a long time when our ship date was, and we like moved things around, cut features, all that kind of stuff uh, to get it out there. And I'm glad we did, because mm. now, now it's out there, and now we can think about adding those things or, you know, weighing those against all the new great ideas we have. Um, and it's easy to get sidetracked as just someone that like has their nose down in the game all day, like programming something. Oh, well, let me just like go on this track and let me, let me try this visual effect, and um, you can just do that endlessly. Uh, Man, so how do you know when something needs to be cut? Um, well, when you when you tell someone about it and they're like, okay, great. sounds like a fun idea. How long is that going to (laughs) take? And how many people you need to take off what they're doing now to work on that? Like, oh, right. Maybe this is not as genius of an idea as I thought it was. (laughs) Mm. Or maybe it needs to like wait until later. Um, So, yeah, it seems like um, in the process of like iterating on an idea, whether that means working on an actual sequel or just, you know, uh, prototyping new things, like um, a lot of it comes down to like, getting at the core of what you were trying to achieve with something uh, with yeah. the game. So I wonder, like, what do you think the core uh, of Nidhogg is from a design standpoint? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a tug of, it's a weapons-based tug of war. And uh, so you just, I want to, like, flood the player with options, but, like, I don't know. It's The core is, like, the core is kind of rock, paper, scissors, I guess, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like a few layers of rock paper scissors combined with tug of war. Um, <laughs> I don't know. A lot, no, a lot of 
you know, and it's like the controls aren't sloppy, but it's like it's sometimes or it's often easier to imagine what you want to do than it is to like actually do it. And sometimes what you tried to do ends up failing, but you do this more amazing thing by accident, which so it has these like moments of luck that aren't like random, but they're just. Um, it's kind of why you can play this game with your four-year-old, which I've heard of people doing, and like they don't immediately lose. They still have a good time because they feel like they did a bunch of things and like they only just missed out on like a few key moments that caused them to lose. Yeah, um, definitely. This game uh, and its predecessor, like excellent party games, right? There are games that you can watch, that you can easily approach and play, or that you can spend a lot of time trying to master. Uh, yeah. And yet, you know, unlike um, at least in my experience, like a fighting game or something, or a, or a MOBA, um, if you spend hours and hours trying to master it, and then you just get totally wiped by somebody who just walked up and picked it up, it doesn't right. feel frustrating. It doesn't feel bad. It just kind of, uh, it just, it's just kind of funny. Um, I felt that way about the original too, but this one definitely that that uh, humor is heightened by the aesthetic. Um, this is a tricky question because it might have just been by accident, but like. Was that a conscious decision on the team's part? This idea that it's like an approachable, easy to pick up, hard to master, just goofy slaughter fest, or did that just kind of naturally happen yeah, during no, development? For sure. I mean, that's one of the reasons we constrained the controls so drastically. Like, there's only two buttons in the game. Mm. Um, there could easily be a throw button and like other combinations using that button, but um, I didn't want to go there. I wanted to like make sure everything was. You know, only these three buttons, these two buttons plus the joystick, and um, you could play it without even knowing that you can move the sword up and down. Like that could be a sort of higher level strategy that you learn later. Um, so the game kind of opens up as you realize there's all these context-based actions you can do that aren't really combos. They're just like, oh, what happens if I press this button while I'm holding this other button? Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, I think uh, also, um, I think I think like the the weight of every match is really. Like lightened by the fact that the winner just gets totally devoured at the end. Right. Like, right. Uh, so I, it's interesting you point that out. I didn't really think about that. You um, increase the complexity of the graphics, of the weapons, of like the. It seems like the moves as well. I mean, the 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 dive kick has been changed. A bunch of other things have been. It feels like a lot different than the original. Um, but the input has not. The input is, feels basically the same, right? Two buttons yeah. and control. Um, like if you had your cat playing the game, it wouldn't. <laughs> You know, it would look like something. It wouldn't look like nothing, right? It wouldn't, you know, the character would be like bouncing around doing stuff, even though, you know, the cat doesn't really know what it's doing. Yeah. I mean, like, something that is like uh, kind of sublime is that the cat could easily kill you if you just accidentally right. failed yourself on its sword, um, right. which has totally happened when a friend of mine put his controller down on the original. I feel like that happened in the original, right? Didn't that, like, you could just kind yeah. of accidentally yep. run onto a repair yep. um, because you're really good at video games. Nice job, Bryant. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in chat that I just want to grab. Um, <laughs> it's kind of silly but fun. Uh, Neo Calplace wants to know why a Nidhog for two instead of another apocalyptic force. What is it about this um, this core conceit, this lore that appeals to you? Um, yeah, I mean the the origin of the Nidhog being in the game was just that roommate from back when I first started the prototype. Uh, just suggested, why doesn't a Nidhogg eat you at the end? I don't remember why he was thinking about it, but um, the more I read about Nidhogg, the more it felt like, oh, you know, it's kind of this <laughs> balancing force in, uh, in, in this world. Like, it, it's a creature that lives underground, and there's this, like, world tree that's kind of everything good and alive, and this creature is kind of gnawing at the roots, preventing it from getting too big. Um, it's eating corpses. Um, it's just I don't know. It felt like sure it may, kind of makes sense. And in our world, the Nidhog like there's multiple Nidhogs in Nidhog Two, and there's this weird Nidhog hunting ship that you're fighting on right now. And there's there's a bit we've strayed a little bit from the Norse mythology, but uh, <laughs> yeah, just a noticing, smidge. <laughs> I was noticing the uh, the every level finds new ways to be gruesome, and then I like this meat freaking meat hook factory right here is just another especially like uh yep. so like speaking of this like weird uh like neon uh like sunset take on a i don't know this is like a like a weird airship or something um we were talking earlier about how we're all uh currently at least california boys and i kind of wanted to get a sense of um do you think this game would be different if you were 
if you lived somewhere else, if you were based somewhere else, I mean, you, uh, you've, you've taught game design locally for some time, not anymore, obviously, but you're also like adjacent to a, a really strong and vibrant local game dev community um, in LA. So like, it, how much of this game will be different if you were, say, you know, in Philadelphia or in Illinois or Denmark? Washington, D.C. Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, I worked on the first game for a number of years while I was living in New York. Uh, oh. So, I don't know. But I guess this game, you could argue, is brighter and happier. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and, and you know, I, I was goofing on the on the, on the the sweet aesthetic. Um, but really, also, I meant, like, it's, it's a local game. So it, it sort of, like, really benefits from being taken around to a lot of shows. Right. Uh, and being put in front of a lot of players. And that seems like it... it it might be trickier in a more remote location. Well, yeah, maybe so. I've, I've always lived in cities, <laughs> um, so I don't know. Um, I'm definitely like travel around, travel around a lot to like different conferences and things like that to show the game, you know, wherever it gets in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been to like took it to IGF and Indiecade and all that stuff. Do you ever? Um, I think was something that appealed to me about the first New Talk when I saw it at Indiecade in like 2013 was. Um, like the kind of ritual like element to it, like this whole ritual sport thing. Um, since there's an actual like overlay, because like you know the idea is like they're fighting to be eaten by a gu- by the nidhog. Um, have you thought about much, but like between the connection between like game and ritual at all? Because it just seemed like such kind of an overt text thing, and I wonder if that was something that appealed to you personally, besides just your roommate suggesting it. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. I thought about a lot. I thought a lot about uh, how to make it, you know, interesting for spectators to watch mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. Like it's always, it was in, immediately popular as a spectator game. You know, at least at festivals, maybe not online. Um, so we've always tried to keep that element and keep that element like frictionless. Like mm-hmm. some of this new uh, UI stuff we added, like the the middle map locator was you know, for that benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, just so people jumping in can understand like more easily, like, what's the status of the game? Where are you? you know, mm-hmm. Would you con- would you consider like create I mean obviously Twitch is now like a nice way for people to view Nidhogg, but uh as other games like add like uh platform ways to like view other people's gameplay like uh spectator modes, would you consider adding something like that? Yeah, we're we're working on it. We're trying to figure out the best way to do it, um since Currently, our online mode uh, relies on you being there when it, when the game starts. So, it's, yeah. so, but we might just add a spectator mode where you have to be a spectator when the game when the round starts and mm-hmm. try to expand on that later. But yeah, definitely been thinking about it. Um, right on. Yeah, no, this should definitely have like a weird esports streaming setup, just like a giant overlay and like a little room in the corner for somebody to shout over it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we unfortunately have got to wrap this up in the next few minutes. Brian, do you think? You can achieve a nidhog. Uh, no achieved, pressure. I've already achieved a bunch. Um, you have. You, no, I, I just think it'd be. I just think it'd be <laughs> like really fitting to go out in the belly of a great worm. Nope. Well, nope. Not gonna I happen. Not, not feeling. I'm not feeling our nidhog awe is happening very soon. It's gonna take a few minutes to get past Knife Feet Boy here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any final questions? Any final thoughts? Um. How's it feel, Mark? Like your game's out, and uh, now you're doing interviews with schmucks like us. Uh, um. <laughs> How's it feel? Uh, it feels great. Um, yeah, it feels great. I want to give a shout out to the rest of the team. Uh, we got Christy and Toby and Fadim has been amazing. Matthias, uh, our PR guy Brian, Aaron who did the PS4 port. Um, I'm missing a lot of people. We've worked with a lot more people this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, our, our testing team, Enzyme. Um, Boy, this is embarrassing. I should have put a list in my notepad here. <laughs> no, it's okay. There's no no one's no one's gonna play you off. There's yeah. no there's no hook. There's yeah. no cane. There's a, uh, there is a credit section in the game I could just pull up, but uh, you could pull it up. That's okay. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta oh, get a uh, Before we go, I really like the title screen. Um, I don't know if we're gonna have a chance to see it before we go again, but there is this just beautiful, Joe, just disgusting. Joe Kowalski. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was all hand animated by him. Um, yeah, want, but once you're like it. a series of iterations that were more, more and less drippy, and some of them had like big bands of color instead. Um, but, yeah. The the drippiness really seems to be like a theme uniting these two, even as the aesthetic changes a lot. Uh, 
uh, just just like seeing things just erupt in gross like bursts of color like they're just filled with paint it's sort of like just like I, I, what is that like well, this is like a, this is like maybe a too long question for the last two minutes but like i just remember that from the original too like every character just seemed like they were walking paint ball like paint yeah. why, why is that is that just for fun is it more readable yeah i just it's fun because you can kind of see the history of the, the arena and like you know what parts are tricky for one person mm. um and i also just didn't want it to be too serious and murdery. Like, yes, they do explode into gore, piles of gore, but um, I think if everything were like realistic red blood, it might be a different vibe. Uh, <laughs> like a kind of more serious, sad wartime vibe or something. Yeah. <laughs> Man, what was that? That was like a Genesis fighting game, like Warlords or something, that was just like super, super gory and bloody. I don't know. That would be a weird throwback to. Um, like a more attitude era uh fighting game yeah. um well yeah want me to wrap it up sure oh i mean no pressure i mean here you are you could just you could just do this you you're on the last screen want... aren't you nope come on you're the best uh, yeah. there you go all right i guess we're staying right, 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 right. Hug. you're the best all right ah, just... eat eat my feet <laughs> that's the thing about this game is like i've had to restrain myself from the usual amounts of shouting i do no no, yeah, you've been you, you've been uh, very restrained. This is a game, that, you know. Uh, this is the game that encourages shouting. It you know it helps if you have a drink or two. But even if you haven't, this is a game that encourages people just to scream and shout and yell, uh, and laugh, which is uh, a nice nice thing to exist. Uh, oh, nice. Whoops. There's your nidhog the boys. poo room. Ugh. Oh, it is. It All is kind of a yeah. You got poo. I didn't notice that before. Uh, mm. I earned my chicken dinner. Nice. Take us out, Brian. Very all right. Bird. Thank you all for joining us on the Gamma Sutra Twitch channel. I have been Brian Francis, a contributing editor at Gamma Sutra. This has been Alex Waro, and uh, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. If they have any questions okay. about making multiplayer games, where should they find you? Uh, Twitter at Messhoff, M-E-S-S-H-O-F, or uh, Discord.gg slash Nidhog. Ooh, a Discord channel. Awesome. Yeah. That's the first we've had recommended on the stream. Well, uh, thank you for watching, everyone. We'd appreciate it if you if you enjoyed this conversation, if you enjoyed talking to developers, we'd appreciate it if you clicked the follow button so that you can chat with more great developers making great games. Thank you so much, and have a good day. Bye. Cool. Bye. Bye.